does not endorse or recommend any specific manufacturer or product. In order to show skills clearly, the healthcare providers in this video do not always use recommended personal protective equipment, such as gloves. Cardiovascular disease strikes men and women in every nation around the world. From sudden cardiac arrest to the disabling effects of acute coronary syndromes and acute ischemic stroke, cardiovascular disease remains a leading cause of disability and death in many parts of the world. Cardiac arrest occurs in both men and women without warning or within just a few minutes after symptoms appear. Understanding and activating the systems of care developed by the American Heart Association can help improve survival rates and prevent cardiac arrest. You play a pivotal role in providing high quality emergency cardiovascular care. What you do matters. What you learn can save lives. In adults experiencing sudden cardiac arrest due to ventricular fibrillation or pulseless ventricular tachycardia, the heart is quivering but not effectively pumping blood to vital organs. These patients have a much higher survival rate if they receive immediate chest compressions and early defibrillation. A defibrillator should be used as soon as it is available. If there are two or more rescuers present, CPR should be performed while the defibrillator is being attached. When necessary, healthcare providers may tailor the sequence of rescue actions to fit the most likely cause of arrest. For example, in cases involving drowning or other instances where hypoxia is the likely cause of cardiac arrest, Ventilation becomes much more important than in cases of non-asphyxial arrest. The American Heart Association continues to place a strong emphasis on high-quality CPR. This is indicated by a rate of 100 to 120 chest compressions per minute, a compression depth of at least 2 inches in adults, allowing complete chest recoil after each compression, minimizing interruptions in compressions, avoiding excessive ventilation. Scientific studies continue to link high quality CPR to return of spontaneous circulation or ROSC and to improved survival. High quality chest compressions maintain blood flow to vital organs, especially the heart. One way to measure the effectiveness of chest compressions is to monitor coronary perfusion pressure. Coronary perfusion pressure during CPR must reach 15 millimeters of mercury to potentially achieve ROSC. As chest compressions begin, it takes several compressions to raise the coronary perfusion pressure to a level adequate to supply blood to the heart. The higher the coronary perfusion pressure during CPR, the higher the chances of survival for patients. When healthcare providers interrupt chest compressions, coronary perfusion pressure decreases dramatically and remains very low until compressions are resumed. A reasonable surrogate for coronary perfusion pressure is arterial relaxation or diastolic pressure. However, because coronary perfusion pressure or arterial diastolic pressure measurements are not readily available during a resuscitation attempt, healthcare providers can monitor CPR quality with waveform capnography. An end tidal CO2 reading of less than 10 millimeters of mercury suggests that achieving ROSC is unlikely. Providers should improve CPR quality by optimizing chest compressions. To perform high quality chest compressions, healthcare providers should push hard and push fast. Push hard means the provider should compress the chest to a depth of at least two inches. The chest should completely recoil after each compression. If it does not, coronary perfusion will remain low. Push fast means to compress the chest at a rate of 100 to 120 compressions per minute. Chest compression rate is directly linked to improved ROSC and survival rates. However, Survival rates decline when compression rates exceed 120 per minute because compressions tend to become shallower as speed increases. A metronome will help rescuers maintain the appropriate rate. It can be difficult to maintain the correct depth at such a vigorous pace, which is why the American Heart Association recommends that compressors switch after two minutes or even sooner if the compressor experiences or shows signs of fatigue.
Another characteristic of high-quality CPR is minimal interruptions in chest compressions. Studies demonstrate that healthcare providers interrupt compressions far too often and for too long, in some cases spending 25 to 50 percent of a resuscitation attempt without delivering chest compressions. Chest compression fraction, or CCF, is the proportion of time during cardiac arrest resuscitation when chest compressions are performed. CCF should be at least 60%, but ideally greater than 80%. Data suggests that lower CCF is associated with decreased ROSC and survival to hospital discharge. CCF is a measurable goal, one that providers should strive to achieve. In line with this, the American Heart Association cautions providers against spending more than 10 seconds checking for a pulse, assessing the patient, or doing anything else other than chest compressions. Finally, in performing high-quality CPR, the rescuer must avoid excessive ventilation. For arrest patients, appropriate tidal volume should be approximately 500 to 600 milliliters, enough to see visible chest rise. This is about half a squeeze of an adult ventilation pack. Excessive ventilation can not only cause gastric inflation and resulting complications, but can also increase intrathoracic pressure, decrease venous return to the heart, and lower cardiac output and chance of survival. The AHA recommends the use of audiovisual feedback and prompt devices during a resuscitation attempt or during training for real-time monitoring of CPR quality. In terms of defibrillation, we emphasize the fluid integration of early defibrillation within high-quality CPR. Healthcare providers should start chest compressions and use the AED or manual defibrillator as soon as possible for the best patient outcomes. Some EMS systems allow responders to provide a period of CPR while preparing for defibrillation. The AHA still recommends the one-shock protocol for VF and pulseless VT. Across the United States, survival rates for cardiac arrest, acute coronary syndromes, and stroke vary considerably from region to region. It's important that EMS, the emergency department, and in-hospital providers work together, not only to deliver better patient care, but to strengthen the chain of survival for future cardiovascular patients. That starts with identifying the weak points in your system's chain of survival. Gathering data and measuring patient outcomes can identify areas that need improvement. To deliver the highest quality patient care by using this team approach, there must be an integration of community, EMS, physician, and hospital resources. This process must focus on immediate recognition of cardiac arrest and activation of the emergency response system, early CPR with an emphasis on chest compressions, rapid defibrillation, effective advanced life support, and integrated post-cardiac arrest care. To deliver the highest quality patient care, integrated systems of care should include community members, EMS, physicians, and hospitals, as well as in-hospital medical emergency teams and rapid response teams, often referred to as METs and RRTs. These teams typically consist of healthcare providers with both critical care or emergency care experience and the skills to support immediate intervention for life-threatening situations based on early detection. These teams are responsible for performing a rapid patient assessment and initiating appropriate treatment to reverse physiologic deterioration and prevent a poor outcome. Some rapid response systems use specific physiologic criteria to determine when to call the team. The following list gives examples of such criteria for adult patients. Threatened airway, respiratory rate less than six or greater than 30 breaths per minute, heart rate less than 40 or greater than 140 per minute, systolic blood pressure less than 90 millimeters of mercury, symptomatic hypertension, unexpected decrease in level of consciousness, unexplained agitation, seizure, significant decrease in urine output, and subjective concern about the patient. Published before and after studies of these teams have reported a 17 to 65% decrease in cardiac arrests after the intervention, along with other significant benefits. For this reason, the American Heart Association strongly recommends that hospitals establish a rapid response system. In the more than five decades since chest compressions were first attempted on a cardiac arrest patient, there have been significant improvements in the treatment of acute cardiovascular disease. Research confirms that high-quality CPR is the foundation for successful resuscitation. Healthcare providers should focus on rate and depth of compressions and minimizing interruptions. Feedback devices have proven beneficial in maintaining high-quality CPR. But there is much more work to be done. 
With the latest research pointing to new, quantifiable ways to improve patient outcomes, advanced providers have more tools than ever before to reduce disability and death caused by cardiovascular diseases and stroke.